Hello students. Today we're going to talk about chapter 10, muscle tissue. And you're going to see some animations through here that you have to be connected to the internet to view. So just make sure you're connected to your Wi-Fi or internet somewhere and review the animations in the PowerPoint. So this is a summary chart of the three types of muscle tissue in the body. We have skeletal, cardiac, and, and smooth muscle in the body. We need to know some of the basic uh, characteristics of these muscle tissues, location, function, appearance, and the control regulation of contraction. So skeletal muscle, notice I put here is located in skeletal. That just means in skeletal muscles that are attached to the bones around the body that you are learning in the bone chapters. Skeletal muscle functions in allowing us to move. When a muscle, skeletal muscle contracts, pulls on a bone and it causes bone movement. Out of all three muscle types, skeletal muscle is the only one that has more than one nucleus per cell, so we say it's multinucleated. And if you look in a little graphic, you can see little lines or striations. So we say that the tissue is striated, and you do have voluntary conscious control over your skeletal muscles, so we say that the control is voluntary. Cardiac muscle tissue is found in your heart. It's involved, as you probably already know, when it contracts and relaxes, as all muscle tissues do, the heart pumps blood through the cardiovascular system. The cells are uninucleated, so it has one nucleus per cell. They are, the tissue is striated, just like skeletal muscle. And unlike skeletal muscle, they have these dark, thick staining transverse lines that you can see here. These are called intercalated discs, and that's where the, the adjacent cardiac muscle cells join together. And you do not have voluntary control over your heart, so we say it's involuntary. Smooth muscle is around various organs in your body, like uh, your stomach and your intestine and your, your gastrointestinal tract. That's what GI stands for, gastrointestinal tract. It's also found around other uh, organs in the body, like your bladder, urinary bladder, some around the gallbladder, uh, smooth muscles around certain blood vessels in the body. So it has a wide variety of different functions um, that really comes about depending on what tissue it's located in. For instance, the smooth muscle around your stomach is involved in contracting and relaxing to churn up the food in your stomach and thus pass that food into the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. Same thing in a small intestine. It moves the food items through your gastrointestinal tract. Smooth muscle cells around blood vessels in the body, when they contract, alter the diameter of a blood vessel. So if the smooth muscle relaxes, the, the vessel gets bigger in diameter, and that actually causes for a decreased resistance and drop in blood pressure. If we get a uh, smooth muscle contracting, that decreases the size of the vessel that increases resistance and increases blood pressure. So we're going to talk more about all of that in AMP2, but nonetheless, smooth muscle, depending on where it's at, has a wide variety of functions. Um, it is uninucleated, one nucleus per cell, and this one out of all three have no striations in the tissue. And you do not have conscious control over it, so we say it's involuntarily regulated. Now, here's some generalized functions of muscle tissue. Uh, as just said, muscles allow us to move body parts. We stabilize our body positions, like your back muscles and the muscles in your neck. Regulation of organ volumes, like smooth muscle. There are special little bands of circular muscle that can contract to close off an open organ. For instance, when our urinary bladder fills up with urine, we have a little round circular muscle, actually two of them down there, but one of them is made of smooth muscle, and when it's contracted, the urine is, is housed and closed up in the urinary bladder. However, when we go to the bathroom, those circular muscle bands relax 
and it opens up a tube, the opening of the, the hollow organ, and the contents can come out. So those little circular bands are called sphincter muscles, sphincters. Um, the movement of substances within the body. The heart pumps blood, as I just mentioned. When your skeletal muscles are contracting, they squeeze on special vessels called lymph vessels, which causes lymph to move through the lymphatic vessels. Urine is forced out of the urinary bladder via contraction of smooth muscle around the urinary bladder. Your diaphragm and other muscles of respiration uh, contract and relax to allow air to move in and out of your lungs. Smooth muscle around the GI tract causes uh, food and fluids to move through the GI tract and muscle contraction in a special tube called the vas deferens smooth muscle contracts and relaxes rhythmically to cause sperm to leave the, the male reproductive system. One of the byproducts of muscle contraction is the production of heat. So when we get cold we shiver which is an erratic response of skeletal muscle contraction and it produces heat which warms us up. So you can see there's a wide variety of functions of muscle tissue around the body. Now all muscle tissues have in common these basic characteristics. All muscle tissue is excitable, so we say excitability. And cells around the body, like cells in a nervous system and muscle cells, have the ability to respond to chemical signals and produce electrical impulses from it. So that's called excitability. All muscle tissue is excitable. Muscle tissue is also conductive. So we say conductivity. That's the ability to take the electrical impulse that was generated and move it along the surface of the cell. That's called propagation. All muscle tissue contracts and relaxes. So we say contractility. And contractility is the ability to shorten and produce force. Extensibility is the ability to be stretched without being damaged. So muscle tissue is very extendable. We can stretch it. And it's very elastic. Elasticity. Elasticity is the ability to return back to the original shape after being deformed or stretched. So muscle tissue contains those properties. Now we need to talk about some terminology dealing with muscle physiology. And so we need to go over some, some terms and then uh, look at the structure of how muscles are organized, specifically skeletal muscle. So if you look up here at the simple little drawing, there's a little transverse plane. It's cutting through the humerus right at the level of the origin of the brachioradialis muscle right here. So if we look at that enlarged over here, we can see how everybody knows a tendon attaches a muscle to a bone. But we have some basic connective tissue components that all bond together to form the tendon. So surrounding the whole muscle, we have a connective tissue called the epimyceum. <clears throat> so the epimyceum is a connective tissue membrane that wraps around the whole muscle. Now if you look inside the muscle, we have all these circular structures. These circular structures are called fossicles. Fossicles are circular bondings of many muscle cells which are called a muscle fiber. So within each fossicle, there are many muscle cells surrounding each fossicle and thus separating it from every other fossicle inside the muscle organ is a connective tissue membrane called the perimyceum. Now if we look on the inside of a fossicle, that's where all of the muscle cells are located. And remember, they're all bound together within that group by the perimyceum. So individual muscle cells, which are often referred to as a muscle fiber or a myofiber, are separated from each other inside the fossicle by another connective tissue, which is called the endomyceum. Now, if you notice on the inside of an individual muscle fiber, so here's a muscle fiber. There's also tubular structures. These tubular structures are called myofibrils. Don't confuse that name with myofiber or muscle fiber. Muscle fiber and myofiber are referring to the muscle cell. 
myofibril refers to the bundling of muscle proteins inside the cell within these tubular shaped structures. So again, these tubular shaped structures are called myofibrils. They're made up of what are called the muscle filaments, or you'll also read, it'll call them in several books and maybe in my notes, myofilaments. So we have myofilaments, the contractile proteins and other proteins in the muscle that are arranged in this tubular structure called the myofibril. So the inside of the muscle cell, which is also called the muscle fiber or myofiber, is loaded down with other organelles we have to talk about, but also these tubular arrangements of myofilaments within what's called the myofibril. So as far as the muscle cell is concerned, the myofiber, if you will, we're going to change the name of some of the organelles and structures that you learned in general biology. So, for instance, the plasma membrane is going to be referred to as a sarcolemma. The inside of a cell in general has cytoplasm. In the muscle cell, we're going to call the cytoplasm sarcoplasm. The sarcoplasm in a muscle cell is typically loaded down mainly with protein. And at least in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, the protein is arranged in these tubular shaped structures called myofibrils. So here's a myofibril that's been enlarged. Now, encircling the myofibrils is a very special organelle that we learned about a long time ago, which you learned to name as smooth endoplasmic reticulum. In the muscle cell, we're going to call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is also abbreviated SR. <clears throat> now, as far as the muscle is concerned, we have to learn about all of the different types of proteins that will allow the muscle to contract and thus relax, and we have to have regulation between the two, and we're going to learn the physiology of how muscle contraction is activated. So here's a generic drawing. The little blue line represents the plasma membrane, now called the sarcolemma. These structures represent that internal organelle called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which, who, which sar, the SR's whole job is to store and release calcium ions to and from the sarcoplasm. So this represents the SR. Now, the surface of the sarcolemma is not just completely flat. There are these tubes that dive deep in the cell. These are called transverse tubules and or t-tubules and they will be a part of the physiology talk uh, in order to get calcium ions to be released from the SR and of course skeletal muscle cells have multiple nuclei in them that's why I call them multinucleated <clears throat> so here we have a myofibril a couple of them demonstrated in the middle of the muscle cell and the myofibril and thus all the myofilaments that make it up are actually anchored to the sarcolemma at either end by a special anchoring protein called dystrophin. This is going to be one of the structural proteins that we identify and will learn about in a minute. So dystrophin anchors the myofibril to the edges of the cell at what is called a transmembrane protein so that when the contractile fibers within the myofibril start to cause contraction to occur, meaning the myofibril shortens. When the myofibril starts to shorten, it pulls on the edges of the cell so the whole cell will shorten towards the middle. And that's what we call contraction. Now, muscle cells have a lot of mitochondria. Some have more, some have a little bit less. Uh, but the mitochondria, if you remember, is involved in aerobic respiration to make ATP, which in this case will be the fuel source in order to drive contraction. Now, in order for oxygen to be moved around these fairly long cells, these cells are quite long, we have to have a protein that carries oxygen on the inside of the muscle cell. That, that molecule is called myoglobin. It's a related molecule to hemoglobin in blood that carries oxygen in the blood. So we do have myoglobin that's involved in carrying the oxygen in the cell. Now, we can store sugar 
inside the muscle cell, and we do that within these little granules called glycogen granules. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in our body, in our cells. We have a large store of glycogen in our liver, and you have a lot of glycogen stored in your muscle so that if we need to have quick muscle contraction, we can utilize this sugar in order to make ATP either anaerobically or aerobically. And the aerobic part of it happens in the mitochondria. We're not going back over all the steps of aerobic respiration, but aerobic respiration is completed in the mitochondria. Anaerobic respiration occurs in the sarcoplasm. So here is a myofibril, and we see some of the proteins enlarged. We have to know what these proteins are, and we have to know exactly what we're looking at here. So earlier, I said that skeletal muscle and cardi cardiac muscle is striated. That means we see light and dark staining bands in the muscle tissue. So where do those band, light and dark bands come from? Well, the light and dark bands come from a repeating pattern of arranged proteins in a structure called a sarcomere. So a sarcomere, which goes from this structure, which is called a Z-disc, from one Z-disc all the way to the other Z-disc, is what we call one sarcomeric unit, one sarcomere. A sarcomere is an individual contractile element within the myofibril. So here's the myofibril up here. You would have one sarcomere from here to here, and if the myofibril was drawn longer, you would have one from here to there, all the way to the end, either end, there are tandem repeating patterns of sarcomeric units. So what is a sarcomere made of? Well, we have what we call thick and thin myofilaments, or thick and thin filaments. The thin filament is called the actin filament, the thick filament is called the myosin filament. Now, the thin filaments are anchored directly to the Z-discs, as you see in this picture. The thick filament is suspended in the middle of the sarcomere in a relaxed muscle via a, a bundling structural protein called titan. So here's another protein. It's not a contractile protein, but it's another protein. It helps organize the, the thick myosin filament in the sarcomere. In the very middle of the myosin thick filament, we have another bundling protein that organizes the myosin filament in the middle, and that's called myomesin. I'm going to show you that name in a minute. And the myomesin forms a little bitty line in the middle of the thick filament called the M line. So let's look at this sarcomeric unit for a minute. If we consider where we only have thin filament relative to where we have thick filament, and we looked at it under a microscope, we would be able to see a light pattern and a dark pattern. The light pattern right here is called the I band. The I band of a sarcomere is where in a relaxed muscle we see really only the thin filament. There's other proteins in there, but we don't see the thick filament. The thin filament is anchored there to the Z-disc. So since the thick filament obviously is thicker than what we call the thin filament, the thick filament would absorb more light if you're looking at it under a microscope, and thus it would look darker. So the whole length of the thick filament is what we call the dark band, or the A band. So the A band is the entire length of the thick filament. Now, so this is what gives us our light band and our dark band. Our light band and our dark band to give the muscle tissue its striated appearance. So skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is striated, so we have these repeating sarcomeric units in this fashion, and that's what le leads to their striated appearance. Smooth muscle is non-striated. That means they don't have repeating, regular repeating patterns of sarcomeric units like this. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, if we look at the sarcomere a little bit more, there's a couple other areas we can identify. In a relaxed muscle, the thin filament slightly overlaps the thick filament at the edges of the A-band. So right here and right here, we would actually have a little bit darker of an area. 
because there's more protein filaments absorbing light right there than in the middle of the A-band. Now, the whole A-band is called the dark band or the A-band. But if we look at the very middle of an A-band in a relaxed muscle, it looks just a little bit lighter than the edges of the A-band because at the edges we have this overlap. So the very middle of the A-band that's a little bit lighter in a relaxed muscle is called the H-zone. And then obviously in the middle of the H-zone, we have the M-line. Now we're not identifying the, the parts of a sarcomere on our lecture test. That will help you out with your lab when you identify all of that on lab. But you still have to know what the words are. For instance, you have to know that thin filaments are around the Z-disc and is referred to as the I-band. The thick filament in the middle of a sarcomere is the A-band. The very middle of the A-band where you only have thick filament is called the H-zone, and the middle of the H-zone is called the M-line. So I'll put in here a little chart. You don't have to worry about the picture, but the picture is kind of nice because here you see the A, the I band, the light band, and so thin filament, act, act in filament around the Z disc. Then you see the A band, the dark band. In the little middle, you can see the H zone with the M line in it. And then you see another I band. So that's the light and dark and light and dark patterns that we would see. But I really left this in here because it gives you a description of the parts of a sarcomeric unit. So just review that. These are the names of all of the proteins in the muscle. The one, you know, some important ones we have to talk about. And we can classify the muscle proteins in three ways. We have proteins that are called contractile proteins. And in all three muscle types, it's myosin and actin. We have regulatory proteins. Here, troponin and tropomyosin. These two are only found in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. We have different regulatory proteins and smooth muscle. And then the structural proteins that don't lend themselves to contraction or relaxation or regulation at all, but yet organize the muscle tissue. So I just mentioned Titan. Titan helps organize uh, the thick filament in the middle of the sarcomeric unit. Nebulin is an organizing protein of the sarcomeric unit that wraps around the contractile fibers. Um, alpha actinin, this should be actinin, I-N on the end. Looks like I misspelled it. Alpha actinin is, I know I said that funny on purpose. Alpha actinin is a, a bundling protein that helps anchor the thin filament to the Z-disc. So where this thin filament is anchoring to the Z-disc, one of those bundling proteins is called alpha actinin. I mentioned myomycin. That is the organizing protein in the very middle of the thick filament, the myosin filament, so it would be right in the middle. And then dystrophin, which anchors the myofibrils to the sarcolemma. So let's talk about our regulatory proteins a little bit. Oh, wait, sorry. Troponin and tropomyosin and where they are and what they're doing. So in order to regulate contraction, and then allow the muscle to relax, we have to uh, be able to tell the muscle when to do so. So those that happens with the regulatory proteins. Troponin is represented by these three little blue circles, and then we have what we call tropomyosin. Troponin's job is to bind calcium. There's three little subunits here. One subunit binds calcium ions, one subunit binds to the actin filament, and one subunit binds to troponin. So we're just going to call all of it just, I'm, I'm sorry, to tropomyosin. Bind, one of them binds to tropomyosin. We're just going to call this whole group troponin. And I'll tell you what it does in a second. Tropomyosin, on the other hand, is this filamentous, fairly short filamentous protein right here. If you notice, it, this thin filament looks like it spirals. And it's made up of all these circular molecules bonded together. At the tip of each one of the little actin globular units, these are called G-actin, at the very tip of each one is a little dark circle. Those little dark circles are the myosin head binding sites from the myosin molecule. So here's the myosin thick molecule, myosin filament. The my, this thick myosin filament is made up of these myosin molecules, 
which have these head groups. The head groups are the molecular motor that drives contraction because they physically will be able to move something. So notice how they stick up off the top of the thick filament. The, these head groups have to be able to bond to the actin filament at those little binding sites. However, in a relaxed muscle, tropomyosin is blocking the binding sites. So what we have to do in order to get the muscle to contract is expose these binding sites so the myosin head group can bind to the thin filament and then pull on it. So that's part of the physiology talk that we have to talk about. So calcium is going to be the trigger for a contraction. I'll just jump ahead. We need calcium. So calcium is going to be released from the sarcoplasma reticulum in some way. And it's going to go to one place and one place only in a sarcoplasm. It's going to go to troponin. So when calcium is released from the SR, it goes to troponin, which causes this tropomyosin molecule to physically move into this groove of the spiral on the actin filament. And when it moves out of the way, it exposes these binding sites. So the second that those binding sites are exposed, the myosin head groups actually reach up, grab onto and bind to the thin filament, and they pull on it. So let me show you this picture one more time. Look at this sarcomeric unit. In order to get this sarcomere to contract and thus get the whole myofibril to contract and thus the muscle cell to contract, these little myosin head groups have to bond to that thin filament and pull on it towards the M line. So all the head groups on this side, the left side of the M line, will reach up, grab on the thin filament, and pull on the thin filament in order to make the thin filament slide over the thick filament toward the M line. Same thing on this side. All of these head groups pull on the thin filament and make the thin filament slide over the thick filament towards the M line. In that way, when these thin filaments are being pulled towards the middle, the Z discs start to go towards each other and the whole sarcomere shortens. That's what we call contraction. So in order to induce that contraction, these myosin head groups have to be able to physically bind to their binding sites. So those binding sites, when we want to contract the muscle, have to be exposed. And what exposes them? Calcium ions binding to troponin causes tropomyosin to move out of the way of those binding sites. So the myosin molecule can bind to the thin filament and pull on it, and we get contraction. Now, I want you to review the descriptions of these proteins that we just covered. This is just an overview of what I just mentioned about them. So just review that chart. And then this is a level of organization within the skeletal muscle uh, describing some of the features that we've talked about already, like the epimyceum, the perimyceum and the endomyceum, uh, the fossicles, structures within the muscle cell. So just go over their description. This is a summary, a quick summary for you to finalize your study in with. Now, we have to talk about what's called the sliding filament mechanism, or in some books it's called the sliding filament theory. Most new books now are calling it the sliding filament mechanism, and this describes how muscles contract. So I'm going to do so from this picture. So what you're looking at here really are two sarcomeric units back-to-back -back in tandem, and we can see then we have our I band and our A band, our I band and our A band, so forth and so on. Up here represents a relaxed muscle. So if you notice, the distances between the I bands and the H zone and the A band all change when the muscle contracts. Really, the I band and the H zone is what changes. So the reason for that is because the I band is defined as the area where we only have thin filament. But when these myosin head groups start to pull on the thin filament and they slide over the thick filament, you can see by the time we get fully contracted, the Z disc is all the way towards the, the thick filament. So we have an over, a complete overlapping of thick and thin filament. So we really have decreased the I band drastically in a, in a contracted muscle. And the H zone has really disappeared. Remember, the H zone is the area where we only have thick filament. But if the thin filament starts to slide past the thick filament, then 
by the time we're fully contracted, we have a complete overlapping. So this is what we call the sliding filament theory, the, the myosin molecule uh, filament pulls on the thin filament, and the thin filament slide over the thick filament in order to bring about contraction and the shortening of a sarcomeric unit. In order to get the muscle to contract, we have what's called the contraction cycle. The contraction cycle is going to involve two things. We need calcium and we need ATP. So calcium is going to be the trigger for a contraction. We need that. You can't contract your muscle without it. And the calcium is represented on this graphic by this little purple dot. Troponin are the three little blue dots. And then we see tropomyosin. And here, at least you see the myosin head binding sites exposed. That's because calcium is bound to troponin, which forces tropomyosin into that little groove I was mentioning earlier, thereby opening and exposing the binding sites for the myosin head group. So first of all, ATP binds to the myosin head group, and the myosin head group is an enzyme. It hydrolyzes ATP, basically breaks that third phosphate bond, high energy phosphate bond, and it basically leaves behind an ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and a phosphate group. The energy that was released from clipping that phosphate group off of ATP is used in order to energize the myosin molecule. So we have ATP hydrolysis. We energize the myosin molecule, which is much like a spring. Now it's spring-loaded, right? So once that happens, the myosin head group now can reach up, grab onto the thin filament, and bind to those binding sites. That's called a myosin cross bridge, actin cross bridge. So it's called the cross bridge because the myosin head groups are now bridged or bound to the thin filament. Now, when the phosphate group is released from the myosin molecule, it brings about what is called the power stroke. The power stroke is the release of the stored energy from ATP by pulling on the thin filament towards the M line. That is what is going to bring about the actual contraction or the shortening of the sarcomere, the power stroke. After the power stroke has been completed, ADP is released. A new ATP actually binds to the myosin head group, and that is what allows the myosin head group to detach from the thick, from the thin filament. Now consider this. In a person that dies that does not produce ATP anymore, everybody knows the body gets hard after some time. That's called rigor mortis. So what rigor mortis is, is a complete muscle, skeletal muscle contraction without relaxation because once we run out of ATP we can't move from step three to step four. ATP is required in order for the myosin head group to detach from the thin filament. If we run out of ATP as would happen when someone dies there would be no more ATP to bind to the head group and thus it would be stuck and bound to the thin filament in the contracted state. So after some time, depending on the conditions, uh, within you know a day or two, the body starts to get soft again. Uh, that's because, not, not because there's ATP, but because the muscle proteins start to break down. So that's what rigor mortis is. And you, there's a little section in your book you can read on that. All right, so I left the animation in here. Uh, you should view that on the contraction cycle. It basically covers what was just mentioned. Now, we have to start our story, uh, our physiology story, on how we're going to get calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and thus trigger the contraction to occur. So in order to get a piece of the story, we have to look at this picture, which is really a summary picture. And we start up here at the sarcolemma. So in some way, and notice we have the T-tubules as well, right? So in this picture, this represents a relaxed muscle. 
because all of the calcium ions are stored inside this structure, which represents this sarcoplasmic reticulum. On the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we have these little channels, the artist colored in green. Those are called calcium release channels. They're anchored and coupled to what we call a voltage-gated calcium channel, which are loaded down in the T-tubules. So let's look at how these all interact. In some way that we don't know yet, we're going to generate an electrical impulse that's going to propagate along the length of the sarcolemma. That's what the little red line represents, the arrow. That action, the electrical potential that's running along the sarcolemma is called the muscle action potential. Basically, it's an electrical signal. So it's going to propagate down the sarcolemma and enter the T-tubules. That electrical impulse entering the T-tubules activates this voltage-gated calcium channel. It's called that because a change in membrane voltage or elect electrical impulse potential opens the channel. So it's called a voltage-gated calcium channel. When these channels are activated, it causes for the calcium release channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open. And when they open, calcium leaves the SR, floods the sarcoplasm everywhere, and the calcium only goes to one place and one place only. It goes to troponin. The minute, the second, that calcium binds to troponin, it causes tropomyosin to move out of the way of the myosin head binding sites and it allows the myosin head group to bind to the thin filament and pull on it towards the M line, which brings about contraction. So that's a little summary chart for a portion of our story. Here's some text information that I'm about to go over on a picture. I want you to read through it and I'm going to use all this terminology. But we have to learn a little bit about the nervous system today, even though we're not on it. The nervous system is going to interact with our skeletal muscle cells as the nervous system interacts with all of its other target cells in the body at an area called a synapse. The synapse between the nervous system cell, which is called a neuron. The synapse between the neuron and what we call its synaptic end bulb and the skeletal muscle cell is called the neuromuscular junction. So let's look at what this is all about. The electrically excitable cells in a nervous system that regulate physiology around the body are called neurons. So here's a portion of a neuron. The neurons that leave your brain and spinal cord and go to the organs in the body, in this case a skeletal muscle cell, are called motor neurons. The electrical potentials that the neurons generate are then propagated down what's called an axon and their branches. The branch of an axon is also called an axon collateral. At the very ends of the axons are what we call axon terminals, because the axon is terminating at its target cell. At the very end of an axon terminal, it bulges out a little bit. So let's look at this area. At the end of this axon terminal where it bulges out, it's enlarged over here. This bulged out area of an axon terminal is called a synaptic end bulb. The synaptic end bulb is where we contain membrane bound vesicles on the inside of it that contain signal molecules called neurotransmitters. So all of the neurotransmitters that are in these little synaptic vesicles, as they're called, are going to release their neurotransmitter into a little bitty fluid-filled space between the neuron and the target cell. In this case, obviously, the target cell is the myofiber. So let's look at this area enlarged down here. Where the neuron and the muscle cell meet at the synapse, they don't physically touch their membranes together. There's a fluid-filled space between them which is called the synaptic cleft. Now, the synaptic cleft is going to carry the neurotransmitters from the neuron side of the 
synapse across to the muscle membrane or the sarcolemma side of the synapse or the neuromuscular junction. The sarcolemma at the neuromuscular junction is the only place that we have receptors for these neurotransmitters. This neurotransmitter, by the way, the first one you're learning is called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is abbreviated ACH. So the only place we have acetylcholine receptors is on the piece of the sarcolemma that is at the neuromuscular junction, in which case this little patch of sarcolemma has a special name. It's called the motor end plate. So the motor end plate is the only place that we have acetylcholine receptors. So let's briefly look at what's going to happen. So first of all, in order to get your muscle to contract, we have to generate electrical impulses that travel down neurons of the nervous system towards the muscle. Those action potentials in the neuron are called the nerve impulse or the neuron action potential. So here the nerve impulse comes down the axon, term, axon, then the axon terminal. It reaches the synaptic end bulb. That nerve impulse causes for other voltage-gated calcium channels to open in the synaptic end bulb, which causes calcium to flood the inside of the synaptic end bulb, which causes for the exocytosis of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine diffuses across the cleft, binds to its receptor on the motor end plate, and the receptor of the acetylcholine receptor just so the acetylcholine receptor just so happens to be a ligand gated sodium channel. It's a sodium channel that opens in response to chemicals. So any channel that opens in response to chemicals is called a ligand gated channel. So the second that acetylcholine binds to its receptor, the ligand-gated channel, it opens it, and sodium rushes into the muscle cell. The influx of sodium through this channel is what produces the muscle action potential. So let's look at it in summary. We have a nerve impulse that has to be generated to come down the axon and the axon terminal. The nerve impulse reaches the synaptic end bulb at the neuromuscular junction. I know they don't show it here, but that nerve impulse would open a voltage-gated calcium channel on the synaptic end bulb, allow calcium to flow into the synaptic end bulb, which causes the release, the exocytosis of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine binds to its receptor, which is a ligand-gated or Another term for that, chemically gated. You might see chemically gated. A chemically or ligand gated sodium channel. So it opens a channel. Sodium rushes across the membrane through its channel. Acetylcholine does not rush across the membrane. Sodium would rush across the membrane. When sodium rushes across the membrane, it causes this muscle membrane action potential to be generated which propagates down the length of the sarcolemma into a T-tubule, which opens and activates voltage-gated calcium channels to activate and open these calcium release channels on the SR. All right? So these calcium release channels open. Calcium release channels allow calcium to leave the SR to get to the sarcoplasm. When calcium is released in a sarcoplasm, it goes to one place and one place only troponin, which causes tropomyosin to move out of the way of the myosin head binding sites, which allows the myosin head groups to reach up, bind to actin, and pull on it, and you have contraction. Now, in order to relax the muscle, you have to take all of the calcium ions that you once released and pump them back into the SR. That happens via active transporters called calcium uh, active transporters are, are ATPase pumps. So the pump constantly pumps the calcium back in. Without the calcium, the tro tropomyosin troponin complex goes back in the way of the binding sites for the myosin molecule, which relaxes the muscle.
but we also have to get rid of the acetylcholine that's in the cleft. As long as acetylcholine is bound to its receptors, it's going to allow sodium to flow into the membrane and keep this whole process going. So there's an enzyme that I want you to learn that breaks down acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. It's called acetylcholinesterase. This is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine and induces muscle relaxation. All right, now, as far as muscle fatigue is concerned, you know about fatigue. Our muscles get tired, but it's a little bit more than that. Your muscles can actually be blocked from contracting. Now, typically, it won't get to the totally where it can't contract at all, but our muscles, the force that the muscles can generate go down. It gets, it decreases. So why is a maximal force of a muscle contraction decreasing over time when we use our muscles? Well, we start to run out of calcium. We have inadequate release of calcium from the SR. You also start to run out of ATP and we have a depletion of a system called the creatine phosphagen system. So we start running out of this creatine. And people that go to work out probably buy this as a supplement, you know, when to go to the gym. Uh, but this allows us to make ATP very quickly. We start running out of this molecule. Oxygen deprivation, we're starting to run out of oxygen. That's why you start to breathe really fast and deep until we repay that what's called the oxygen debt. So we have to replenish oxygen in order to make our ATP again. We also have a buildup of acid. Everybody knows lactic acid. That starts to decrease our pH locally in the muscle tissue and around it. So that's going to help uh, cause some muscle fatigue as well. And then we have a buildup of ADP. Obviously, we've been using our ATP. So we have too much AT ADP being built up. This is going to have to be reconverted back into ATP. And then the neurons start to have insufficient amounts of the neurotransmitters at the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine. Our cells have to regenerate. Our neurons have to regenerate these neurotransmitters. So if we're using our muscles over and over and over and over and over again, we're slowly depleting our neurotransmitter that activates muscle contraction. All right, so let's talk about a motor unit. A motor unit is a motor neuron from the nervous system and all of the muscle cells that it innervates. So within a muscle organ, skeletal muscle organ, every single muscle cell has an axon terminal attachment to it, has neuromuscular junction. So there are multiple neurons that go to your muscle organ. And depending on how many muscle cells are attached to that single neuron, when that single neuron fires, you may get a different force of contraction. For instance, the purple neuron is only connected to two muscle cells. However, the green neuron in this graphic is connected to three. So if the green neuron fired, only those three muscle cells would contract. And thus, we would only get a force generated from those three contracting. If the purple neuron fired, only these two muscle cells would contract. And thus, the force would be a little bit less because there's one less cell contracting. So a motor unit is basically the neuron with all of its muscle cell attachments. Some motor units are small, like in your eye. They don't have to generate large movements, but they have to generate fine motor movements. So they might have, you know, 5, 10, 15 muscle cells per neuron. But the muscles in your, in your thigh, for instance, have the biggest motor units. They can have a couple thousand or more cells per neuron. So when that one neuron fires, many, many more cells can contract. So we have what is called motor unit recruitment. And that's where we actually start to fire more and more of the neurons that go to that muscle. So we start to get maximal cell contraction. That's why you can pick up something light and then go pick up something heavy. You can generate more force until you get to your maximal level of force because you're utilizing all of your motor units. Now let's talk about a muscle twitch. A muscle twitch is a complete muscle contraction with a complete relaxation. What you're looking at here is a myogram. 
It's a tracing of the contraction force of a muscle. It involves three different phase periods, something called the latent period, the contraction phase or period, and the relaxation period. If we hooked our muscle up to a machine and did our force recording and the muscle was not contracting, we would just see a straight line at the bottom. That would be called the baseline. If we give the muscle the signal to contract, as in the picture shown here with the arrow, for a very, very, very short amount of time, within milliseconds, we don't see any force. Even though the muscle has been stimulated to contract, that's called the latent period. The latent period is the time it takes for all of the signaling mechanisms to occur that we just talked about, and thus to get calcium to be released from the SR, to go to troponin, the whole nine yards to get myosin to pull on the actin, but also to get the slack out of the elastic, uh, the elastic, the elastic proteins inside the muscle. So it's very short, though. You can't even snap your fingers this quick. This is milliseconds. So the whole twitch of a skeletal muscle, a, what's called a quick twitch, lasts anywhere from, you know, 30, 40 to 50 milliseconds. There's a thousand milliseconds in one second. So this is much, 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 much less than one second. And even the latent period, which is only two to five milliseconds or so, very, very quick. But once we get the slack pulled out of the sarcomeric proteins, we then start to generate force. That's called the contraction period. Uh, and then the myosin hair groups leave go of the actin filament and we get relaxation. If the relaxation period comes all the way back down to baseline, that's called a muscle twitch or complete muscle contraction with a complete relaxation. Now the refractory period is a time frame, the time during which a muscle cannot be stimulated to contract again. So skeletal muscles have a quite a short refractory period. That means they can contract, be told to contract again before they relax all the way. Luckily for us, our heart does not do that. So we have what's called fused and unfused tetany. So let's look at what that looks like here. Here's a myogram again. Complete muscle contraction. We have our action potential. We got contraction phase, re relaxation phase. The, the neuron fires again. <clears throat> we have contraction. We begin to relax, but the, the neuron fired too quickly before the muscle could relax all the way. Now, in this case, we fired off to cause the muscle to contract more quickly than it could complete a complete relaxation period, and we caused the muscle to contract again before it was fully relaxed. Now notice the force of contraction is higher on the second contraction attempt. That's because these contraction forces are additive. They are summed up until we get to our maximal level of force. Um, now, then here they show we don't fire again, the muscle relaxes the baseline. Now, if we have neurons that are firing over and over and over very quickly, and the muscle gets a slight relaxation before it contracts again, this is called unfused tetany. Now, this is also called the strep, the, uh, the trep effect. This is what happens when uh, athletes warm up. You want to warm your muscles up. So you see, the first time you contract your muscle, the force isn't that great. But when the muscle is warmed up, the force increases. So this is called unfused tetany. We're allowing our skeletal muscle to contract faster than we are allowing it to relax all the way. Now, if we have a very super fast firing of our neurons, we can contract all the way with no relaxation whatsoever. That's called complete tetany or fused tetany. So this is like a major Charlie horse when we get Charlie horses in our leg, that your muscles contracting without relaxing. It can be between fused and uh, unfused and fused tetany, a Charlie horse. Luckily, our heart does not do that because we would not be pumping blood. Now, the physiology is pretty much the same in cardiac muscle tissue as it is in skeletal muscle tissue with some differences. Number one, the contractile proteins in all three muscle tissue types are the same. It's myosin and actin. The regulatory proteins in skeletal and cardiac muscle are the same, troponin and tropomyosin. Skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is striated. However, cardiac muscle contains these Z-discs 
which skeletal muscle do not. Now the main difference here is this. You could sever every nerve that goes to your heart and your heart would still beat on its own. That's because the, the heart has its own conduction system. Everybody knows your heart has a pacemaker. So the heart can generate its own electrical impulses and then conduct it through the muscle fibers. We're going to learn all about that in the MP2. So we do, we do not need a neuron making a synapse with every single cardiac muscle cell in order to get the, your heart to contract. But we do need that for your skeletal muscle. If you sever a nerve to your skeletal muscle, your skeletal muscle is paralyzed. That's not the case with our heart. Now, as far as smooth muscle is concerned, the arrangements of the contractile proteins are not the same as in skeletal and cardiac muscle. We do have thick and thin filaments, but they're not at a regular arranged pattern as in myofibril, so we don't have the uh, light and dark staining patterns. These, sarco, these sarcomeric looking units, the actin filaments and the myosin filaments, are attached at the membrane of what are called the dense bodies. They're interconnected by an intermediate filament of the cytoskeleton so that when the thick filament pulls on the thin filament, all of these dense bodies are pulled together and they're being pulled on these intermediate filaments and it causes the whole smooth muscle cell to shorten. And a smooth muscle cell kind of shortens in, in a twisting motion, even though they don't show that too well here. So the, it, the actual contraction of the smooth muscle does the same thing. It generates a force, but it just happens a little bit differently. The main difference I want you to know are these regulatory proteins. In smooth muscle, there's no troponin and no tropomyosin. We have calmodulin and myosin light chain kinase instead. So calmodulin takes the place of troponin. Remember, troponin binds calcium. In smooth muscle, calmodulin binds calcium. So when calmodulin binds to calcium, calmodulin activates myosin light chain kinase, and myosin light chain kinase then activates the myosin molecule, which then pulls on the thin filament and brings about contraction. So the main difference here is we have to actually activate the myosin molecule in smooth muscle, whereas in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, the myosin molecule is always on and ready to do its job. That's why we have to have troponin, which blocks and unblocks the myosin and binding sites, because the engine or the molecular motor in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is always on. Remember, myosin is the molecular motor. The molecular motor in smooth muscle, which is still myosin, is not always on. We have to turn it on, like you put a key in your in a car and you turn the engine over and turn your car on. That's sort of what myosin light chain kinase is like. It's like the key to turn on the motor. All right, so that does it for this chapter. If you have any questions, please email me. Tom Russell signing off from Chapter 10.